Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. Lately, I've been missing legendary filmmaker George Romero, and I'm sure you feel the same. A while back, we deconstructed his original 1968 classic, Night of the Living Dead, which shocked audiences worldwide, sparked critical outrage, and ultimately changed the face of horror cinema. Well, today I'd like to take a crack at the sequel, which hit theaters a decade later and sparked its own firestorm of controversy before going on to become the most beloved film in Romero's catalog. As with so many of the classics we've covered in this series, there's very little that hasn't already been said about this landmark in horror history. But honestly, if I don't take a closer look at it, I'll have to turn in my horror fan card, so there you have it. As with all our deconstructing subjects, I'm taking a three-part approach, beginning with Origin, where we go back to Romero's first inspiration for the film. In Legacy, we'll take a look at its impact on the horror genre in general, and zombie movies in particular. And with Mystery, I'll dig even deeper to turn up some behind-the-scenes stories and rare bits of trivia about one of the most influential horror movies of all time, George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for watching Deconstructing and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. If you need a little refresher on Night of the Living Dead and the origins of Romero's cinematic universe, we've got you covered with a dedicated episode. But if you're ready to dive into the history of its brilliant sequel, it's time to go shopping at Pennsylvania's historic Monroeville Mall. Built in 1969, Monroeville was once considered state-of-the-art when it came to indoor shopping centers, which were kind of a new thing back then, and it drew curious patrons from all over the state and beyond. Big time shopping is finally here, Monroeville Mall. Well, it just so happens the mall's general manager, Mark Mason, had mutual friends with Romero, and Mark gave him the grand tour of the brand new facility. Not just the stores, but the inner workings of the building, which was practically a self-contained city, offering just about anything consumers could dream of. One-stop shopping, anything you need, right at your fingertips. That planted the seed of an idea that would ultimately become the sequel to Romero's 1968 classic. Instead of seeking shelter in a rural farmhouse, what would city dwellers do in the event of a zombie outbreak? While Romero got to work drafting the script, news of the project made it all the way to Italy, where legendary director Dario Argento, a big fan of Night of the Living Dead, offered to help raise financing for the production in exchange for the right to recut and sell it to the international market. Argento also introduced him to the music of Goblin, who had gained worldwide acclaim for their score for Profondo Rosso and later Suspiria. Mark Mason not only granted Romero and his crew access to Monroeville Mall for shooting, Mason's company even helped with additional financing. Casting came next, and unlike the loosely defined characters in Night of the Living Dead, Romero sought out actors who personified his vision of the main protagonists. David Emge as pilot Stephen Andrews, Galen Ross as TV producer Francine Parker, Ken Foray as Peter Washington, a SWAT team leader with the best survival skills, who deserts the force along with fellow cop Roger DeMarco, played by Scott Reiniger, who becomes the loose cannon of the group. We whipped them and we got it all! Now, when I said Romero's crew had total access, there were still limits. They had to shoot when the mall was closed and only between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. After 7, the crew and equipment had to be cleared out. That probably would have worked except for one big problem. Cameras started rolling in mid-November of 1977 just as the mall was putting up decorations for the holiday season. They found a way around that, but that meant shooting at the film's other locations until January and returning to Monroeville after the decorations came down. That turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it gave Romero the opportunity to edit the footage they'd already shot into a loose assembly so he would know exactly what additional shots to pick up, as well as allowing some room to improvise and incorporate ideas from the crew. For example, makeup effects legend Tom Savini contributed a lot of those ideas, coming up with more comic touches for his role as the biker Blades, and plenty of elaborate stunts, many of which which he performed himself. Of course, Savini and his makeup team were responsible for transforming legions of enthusiastic extras into zombies, from the hordes of background shufflers to hero zombies that got the most close-ups. Romero gave Savini plenty of freedom in creating more elaborate makeups, and the looser January shooting schedule allowed him to try out some seriously nasty effects. 
One of Romero's many talents was his ability to shoot a wide range of coverage, giving him plenty of freedom in the editing process, where the pace and structure of the story really took shape. You can get an inside view of this process by watching Argento's international cut, which includes many alternate takes, shortened or eliminated scenes to speed up the action, and in some cases used entire sequences Romero had left on the cutting room floor. There was so much spare footage that the film was recut several times before the final English language version hit theaters. Dawn of the Dead had its European premiere on September 1st of 1978, but didn't reach U.S. screens until the following April. There was no doubt the MPAA would slap an X rating on that version, but Romero and producer Richard Rubenstein refused to recut it, which meant it went out unrated. That meant no one under 17 was admitted, and advertising was extremely limited compared to mainstream releases. But trailers and TV spots helped to get the word out, people lined up around the block to see it, and that was just the beginning. In U.S. theaters, Dawn was already in profit by the end of its opening weekend, and its initial run would add up to $16 million. It also caught fire internationally, racking up millions in Italy, Japan, and other territories. Not bad for an indie flick that cost less than a million to make. To this day, it remains the most profitable film in Romero's zombie series. Naturally, in the wake of Dawn's massive success, film markets around the world were falling all over themselves to crank out their own Living Dead epics. The majority of these came from Italy, where studios often produced quick and cheap knockoffs of successful Hollywood properties. Among them, Lucio Fulci's Zombie Due is by far the most infamous. As you might expect, horror fans who missed Dawn's original theatrical run were stoked to see it any way they could. It picked up a lot of attention on the midnight movie circuit, but really came into the public eye when it was released on videotape. The initial US video released from Thorn EMI hit video stores in late 1983, and soon could be found in virtually every video store in North America. Alternate cuts of the film were released in different territories, leading fans to seek out VHS copies of the Argento cut, and even an unfinished version that screened at the Cannes Film Festival, which some mistakenly labeled the director's cut. In reality, the theatrical version is Romero's preferred cut. I'd just like to know who everybody is. Yeah, me too. With the dawn of DVD, the three best-known edits of the film reached even wider audiences, and eventually made their way onto a box set from Anchor Bay called The Ultimate Edition. It's out of print, but not too hard to find yet. UK distributor Second Sight did an excellent remaster of the three main cuts, with documentaries and bonus content as a seven-disc set on Blu-ray and 4K HD, but American fans are still waiting for a similar stateside release. Despite the popularity of the first three dead movies, Romero still couldn't get a major studio to finance a big-budget entry in the franchise. That is, until Zack Snyder's 2004 remake scored big at the box office. Suddenly, the studios began to take notice, and Universal proposed a big-budget adaptation of Romero's dream project, Dead Reckoning. But due to studio tampering and censorship, what was later titled Land of the Dead failed to recapture the magic, and Romero parted ways with Hollywood again. Still, after returning to his low-budget indie roots for two more Dead sequels, Romero couldn't manage to recapture the same lightning that Dawn did in the late 70s and early 80s, the closest Romero got to a truly epic sequel was the manuscript for The Living Dead, a novel he began before his death, which was eventually completed by horror author Daniel Krauss and released in 2020 to critical acclaim and strong sales. The book may be the ultimate zombie epic that Romero always wanted to make, but it's hard to say if the studios are ready to adapt it into a feature film or a limited TV series. Time will tell, I guess. early stages, the script was given the working title, Dawn of the Living Dead, to bring it in line with the first film's title. But Romero eventually dropped the word living from the title when he realized Dawn of the Dead had a more ominous feel to it. If you've seen Day of the Dead, I'm sure you remember the movie's main villain, Captain Rhodes, who meets a grisly and satisfying end. <laughs> Rhodes is played by the late Joe Pilato, but that wasn't his only role in Romero's zombie universe. In a scene cut from the theatrical edition, he plays a completely different character, a rogue cop who almost disrupts Stephen and Fran's escape plan. Steve Andrews. That's me. I'm Steve Andrews. Yeah, no shit. You already know Romero appears in the film's title sequence as the director of the chaotic emergency newscast, alongside his then fiance Christine Forrest. But did you know he appears on camera two other times? He has a blink and you'll miss it cameo as a zombified mall Santa Claus. He also can be seen firing this pistol at one of our fleeing heroes.
Always with an eye on the budget, Romero cast the real-life Pagans Motorcycle Club, who supplied their own hogs. They sometimes got a little too rowdy in the mall and ended up damaging some sections of the floor, but talk about realism. He also got soldiers from Pennsylvania's National Guard to play themselves on camera, and they even brought their own gear. This is probably one of the most notorious anecdotes about Dawn of the Dead. In the original script, Peter and Fran never make a daring escape in the helicopter. Instead, Peter shoots himself dead as the zombies surround him, and Fran decapitates herself by jumping into the chopper's blades. The most contested part of this original ending was whether or not Romero actually shot those scenes. Some actors and crew insist they were present during the filming of Fran's death, while Romero himself insists he never shot the scene. Over four decades later, the debate continues, but the happier ending remains. The Gale and Ross dummy did find its way into another scene, this time made up to look like a man who gets his head blown up real good during the police raid on Housing Project 106. <laughs> If you dig this episode, throw us a like and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell for regular updates. You can also slide into our comments and tell us what horror classic you'd like to see deconstructed next. Thanks for watching. They must be destroyed on sight! <laughs>